We're almost at the palace now, but before we go there, let's explore one of the most mysterious areas in the game, Ashina Depth. The art book has two separate sections on Ashina Depth and Mibo Village, but we'll look at them together, since I go more by Sculptor's Idols categories, and there Mibo Village is included into Ashina Depth. As usual, we'll look at environmental and character art, explore the original names of Sculptor's Idols, and try to find as much curious details as we possibly can. Honestly, I've been dreading this part of the project because I still have no clue what went down in Miba Village and how it's connected to the Fountainette Palace. We'll try to find out together. As usual, we'll quickly go over the disclaimers, legend, and sources. If it's not the first time around, feel free to skip ahead. Number one, use common sense. Please do not assume that I have access to some secret true knowledge. I'm just entertained by reading Sekiro in Japanese. My lore theories are just theories, so treat them accordingly. Number two, I am not a professional translator, I have never worked in localization. Yes, I will say that something is translated poorly and something is not, and it will be my personal point of view. Ultimately, my goal is to give you the information so you can see if the localization was good or not, whether something important was lost or not. My opinion is just that, and I choose to share it. Number three, I am not an expert on Buddhism or Shinto. I will leave links to the religious terms that we will encounter so you can read more on your own if you're interested. As usual, the transcriptions I give do not follow all academic rules and I don't think it's necessary, they are just here to represent the pronunciation in case you're curious. All sources I used for this research will be listed in the description box below, along with all the additional information that I referenced throughout the video so you can read more if you're interested. There you will also find a link to my original blog post if you want to read it through. It has become a routine to start a new video with a follow-up to the previous one, but I just keep forgetting things. There is yet another part of the Sunken Valley that we haven't looked at, and it is only accessible from the Sempo Temple. While I was running around talking to people and making sure I have everything to get all the endings, I suddenly realized that the Buddha in the shrine near Hanbei, where the offering box is, is actually the snake Buddha, but without the snake, it's the same one. I don't know why I'm so surprised. Aradera is located in the ashen outskirts that descends into the valley at some point. I just never paid attention, I guess. I divine abducted Kotaro and visited him in the halls where I got a Tara persimmon from him. Once again I was puzzled by not seeing the Miko kiss that he was seeing until I tried slashing the air with my sword and it hit something. That was quite unexpected, you can even see the visual effect like water ripples when the sword bounces off. There is also a little sound like a distant bell striking, so there are actually kids here that we can't see. I popped a snap seed for no reason at all, threw a few fistfuls of ash hoping to see the silhouettes, but I saw nothing. Well, this discovery was enough for me. Since I was already on Mount Congo and had the divine abduction, I wanted to prove a theory of mine from a long time ago, and I did. You probably know that you can spirit away all the monks, the regular ones and the bomb-throwing ones. If you use divine abduction on them, they just disappear. The same is true for all the terror troop warriors on the mountain, you can spirit all of them away like Kotaro. The rest of the terror troop warriors outside the mountain do not care much, they just turn around, which could imply that all terror troopers of the Sempo temple were abducted when they were kids. No one else can be spirited away, it works only on monks and taro warriors. Ronin, Sempo shinobi, infested monks, monkeys and wolves just get turned around. Let's activate the shinobi kite and grapple all the way across. On the first cliff, there is a snap seed, a sign that this is the realm of the serpent. As we grapple further, we reach the Sunken Valley Passage, only accessible from the Sempo Temple, the other side of the bridge that the serpent destroys as we exit Gunfort. As we emerge from the cave where Badger's son is buried, the white snake is directly below us. I fooled around for a bit and let it eat me by not pressing the second death blow. As usual, I ended up in the snake's den where probably all brides end up which allowed me to grab the dried viscera and touch Poison Pool Idol. Anyway, after you get the fresh serpent viscera, you land on the other side of the bridge. The most remarkable thing here is a little cave where we find another Sokushinbutsu, a monk who undergone self-mummification. There are two items near him, both exceptionally valuable, a Dragon's Blood Droplet and a bundled Jesus statue. Dragon's Blood Droplet is a hardened piece of the dragon's heritage. The only other one on Mount Congo is in the main hall of the statue of the Big Kanon, it's truly remarkable to find it here. A bundled Jizo makes me think that this monk was also haunted by guilt. I just wonder how he got here. Did he somersault his way here like we did? Did he go through the gun for it? 
If so, why was he allowed passage? But now when I think of it, this Sokshinbutsu might be hundreds of years old. Who knows what the gun fort looked like back then? Who knows how long he's been here? It's one of these tiny Sekiro stories that are fully told through the environment and maybe some items lying nearby that I love so much. Your interpretation of them depends fully on your overall knowledge of the Sekiro world. Ashina Depth is a unique area because there are two sculptor's idols in the same room. If you jump down from the bottomless hole idol, grapple a couple of times and drop down from the cave, your idol will be Ashina no Soko, Ashina Bottom or Ashina Depth. If you come here from the White Serpent's Den, you'll drop down onto the Poison Pool idol, Dokudamari. The localization is absolutely correct. I cannot tell you how much I hated this place when I first came here. I died here more than I did on all endgame bosses. Here you can see the patches of red all over the floor and the walls of the cave. I think it's indicative of iron. The statues around the Poison Pool are all identical. In the art book, they're just marked as Bosatsuzo, Bodhisattva statues. The one with a prayer bead on top of his head is holding something in his left hand. There aren't many items a Buddha or Bodhisattva statue can hold. A bowl of herbs, an alms bowl, a lotus flower, or a wealth bowl that is sometimes interpreted as a peach. I think the bowl peach thing is the closest to the onion-shaped item this Bodhisattva holds, and although it is usually an item of the Laughing Buddha Hotei, who looks very different to the ones we have in the poison pool, this explanation is the only one that I have. The bowl is supposed to bring wealth and prosperity. I hope at some point it did. Interestingly, you can just sneak past Shirahagi and be on your way. She seems to be guarding the only path to the hidden forest and Miba village, which is curious. Her original name is Janume Shirahagi, Snake Eye Shirahagi. Her name is also written in katakana, just like Shirafuji's name, but it can also be written in kanji like this. Shirahagi, white bush clover, quite a beautiful flower. Shirahagi is my nemesis. I spend so much time trying to beat her, partly because for the longest time I couldn't see past my own stubbornness and just admit that Sabimaru does not work on her. She just doesn't care. Despite being an Okami descendant, she was able to overcome Blue Rust vulnerability by moving into a pool of poison and living there for who knows how long, accumulating immunity. It's quite an interesting fact if you think about it. The hereditary weakness of the Okami clan can be overcome. The Jan cave just before the hidden forest where we face headless ape is called Shishizaru no Negura, lion ape's nest, or sleeping place. If watering place where the lotus grew was his garden, this is his home where he lived with his partner. Her bones and a heap of brown fur can be found above the arena where the smaller monkey brought her some monkey booze, as a treat or as an offering. I've been here several times, but suddenly this scene seems so sad to me. Guardian ape is called Shishizaru, lion tamarind monkey. He used to be small in size, maybe even smaller than the other brown furred monkeys that look like Japanese macaques. Maybe some monkeys still remember the way he used to be, or maybe his brown furred partner used to look more like all the other monkeys, that is why her remains are being offered monkey booze from one of her kin. On our way to the nest, we meet Sunken Valley gunman who tells us about the giant headless ape that just passed here. I have mentioned the inaccuracy of his dialogue several times already, so we won't discuss it here. After defeating the ape and grappling up to the hidden forest, we yet again meet Jinzaemon. He tells us that he saw the Shamisen player in the mist, it is his first sighting of Orin. He also mentions something very curious, his father knew about the village in the misty woods and warned him against ever going there. This piece of dialogue makes me more confident in my theory that I shared when we discussed Jinzaemon's bundle Jizo, his father is likely Lord Sakuza, or Sakuzaemon, and his mother is likely Urin. Jinzaemon is completely taken by the music, and alas, the next time we talk to him will be the last. After you defeat the Headless Ape, Valley Apparitions Memo will become available for purchase from Fuzioka. Its original name is Sunken Valley Vengeful Spirits Memo. If you look closely at the item picture, you'll see a tiny Shichimun warrior and the soul he summoned. A neat drawing! Interestingly, the memo calls Guardian Ape's burrow Furui Negura, Old Den, likely because he used to live there all the time with his partner, but when she passed away, he abandoned it. Then the original description tells us what the Shichimun warrior is, a vengeful spirit bearing many faces. The distant voice that seems like a woman crying in the ape's den is supposed to be Kingfisher, and this thought never actually occurred to me. 
After defeating the Shichiman warrior, we find malcontent, her whistling ring, which points at the fact that Shichiman warrior consumed her restless spirit. She most likely died here, in the ape's den, and not in his garden. I wonder how she found herself here. It suddenly made me think about the other Shichiman warrior we met near the bottomless hole. I feel like I didn't study him well enough. I think his whole arena used to be underwater, and there might have been a river flowing through those tori gates on the cliff before the chasm at some point. That is why we loot ceremonial tanto from the Shichiman warrior, an item used for worshipping the dragon where people would cut Katashiro out of their life force and send them along the river. Maybe there actually was a river there. That Shichiman warrior must have been hundreds of years old then. Hidden Forest Idol is really straightforward, Kakushimori Hidden Forest. Let's explore it a little bit before going to the monk in the mist noble. There is a bunch of ghosts in the mist, and since I was invisible to them, I got a chance to observe them in their unalerted state. They're just minding their own business, really. Some of them guard loot, others dig soil for something, one of them just sits on the ground drinking sake, living his best apparition life. They grunt and yawn and generally look and behave like regular soldiers that we meet all over Ashina. We'll skip the Gachin headless because we have already talked about him in the very first video and move straight to the Buddhist monk. There is so much to discuss. He is sitting on the ground in front of a bonfire with a whole bunch of Buddhist items. We can see burning sutras, effigies that might represent Buddhas or Bodhisattvas, like our homeward Buddha, and a bunch of Sotoba. Sotoba in Japanese has a meaning of pagoda, and it is a wooden tablet shaped like a five-story pagoda. If you look closely, you can see the five levels defined by indentations. A sotoba is usually set up by the tomb with phrases from Buddhist sutras written on it for the repose of the soul and the name of the deceased. The five stories symbolize the five universal elements of earth, water, fire, wind, and sky. While we're here, let's discuss something called gorintu, which is essentially the same thing, a type of pagoda representing the five elements but made of stone, also serving funerary purposes. As a structure, it was first adopted by Japanese Mikyo Buddhists, Shingon and Tendai sects, in the mid Heian period. We've seen these stone pagodas all over Ashina, they are everywhere. Back to the monk now. Behind him is the big golden statue of undoubtedly Kanon, a bodhisattva that we already met in the Sunken Valley as Jibo Kanon and in Sampo Temple. Here it's likely to be Shokanon, as she has one face, two arms, and lotus buds in her left hand. But as I'm looking at her gracefully holding this psuhe in her left hand, a small water vessel where the lotuses are, something turns inside me. It has always bugged me that I don't know who the Buddha in the dilapidated temple is. You know, the Buddha carved by a true bushi, the kind Buddha, the one keeping the sculptor company and the one sending us to the past. And now I know. Somehow it never occurred to me, but the Buddha in the dilapidated temple is Dutimen Kanon, eleven-faced Kanon. She's missing a lotus flower from the Suihei, but otherwise it's undoubtedly her. Why is she here? Eleven-faced Kanon offers salvation and enlightenment to the living beings in the Ashura realm. It all makes sense. I knew that one day I'll know who this Buddha is, and uh, now I do. And you do too. Now that we have sorted out all the Kanon representations, let's talk to the monk. He is asking us to take on a Butteki, no less, an enemy of Buddhism. He says the enemy is hiding in Haiji, ruined temple, a Buddhist temple, which is important. He claims that the enemy of Buddha closed the entrance to the village by illusory fog to Mayakasu to deceive the villagers. Now, this monk looks like a Sempo monk. He's missing his yellow garments, but otherwise his emaciated body and patches of decaying skin suggest that he is, in fact, a Sempo monk. Interestingly enough, all the other dead monks that we'll see throughout the hidden forest don't seem to be Sempo monks. They have different garments and their prayer necklaces are much shorter. So maybe there is a different Buddhist branch here in Mibo village, and it seems like the Sempo monk just came here to investigate. As we go to the ruined temple, we can see many dead Buddhist monks, and not just dead, but hideously murdered, with their hands tied behind their backs. Some of them are hanged on the tree branches above the greenish lamps, the same ones that the memorial mob have. Before we can reach the temple, we need to fight another sumo wrestler. This time it is Tokujiro the glutton. His original name is Gyuin no Tokujiro, where Gyuin is a part of a Fokanji word Gyuin Bashoku, heavy eating and drinking, literally drinking like a cow and eating like a horse. Tokujiro got the drinking like a cow part, and as we can see, he's addicted to sake. He also has blood-soaked sacks strapped to his waist. Why am I thinking about severed heads? 
Tokuziro is often considered a completely random miniboss just being here without any rhyme or reason, but I don't think it's true. I think he was meant to reach the Miba village, but got lost in the fog. The Sunken Valley monkeys keeping him company seem to be a part of his little group. As for who else might be a part of the group, we'll circle back to it a little later. I find the ruined temple to be incredibly hard to explore during a playthrough because you enter it, Miss Noble turns around, you kill him almost instantly, and then the illusion is dispelled and you've lost the opportunity to look at it. There are 10 Soksunbutsu sitting on the floor and one Miss Noble in red playing his flute, which, as I imagine, is the thing that conjures up the fog. The deity of the temple is unmistakably Jizo with his staff and red clothing. Interestingly, there are two folding screens depicting Sakura Dragon. With Miss Noble's death, not only the fog enveloping the forest is dispelled, but the illusion of the temple as well. We can see now that it is a collapsed building destroyed by fire. There are monk corpses inside. Interestingly, Sakura Dragon's folding screens are intact. I wonder why. Just before the temple, there is a grave filled with more effigies, sotoba and sutras, just like the fire near the monk. Jesus' statues around the grave are beheaded. When we come back to the monk, he says that he is terribly old, but he would like to once more return Buddha to the temple. Now, this seems like a quest, but if it is, I have no clue how to complete it. There is no way for us to drag Kanon back into the temple. I even got excited for a moment there and used a bundled Jizo statue in the temple since there was Jizo in there at some point, but to no avail. The monk doesn't really have any more lines past that one according to his script, so even if it was a quest, it didn't make it into the game. I believe you can spirit him away with divine abduction, but that doesn't really lead anywhere either. So what happened in the hidden forest? There was a Buddhist temple, but one of the Mibu priests seized control of it, threw away the statue of Kanon, burned all items of Buddhism, and murdered all Buddhist monks. The monks, in turn, consider him to be the enemy of Buddha who wants to deceive the villagers. Why such hostility? Well, last time we talked about Shinbutsugo, syncretism of Kami and Buddhas, the assimilation of Buddhism in Japan, its merging with the native religion. It wasn't all that smooth, especially at the start, when Buddhism just arrived in Japan. Buddhism made its way to China and Korea through the Silk Road, and then traveled through these countries to Japan. Thus, early Japanese Buddhism was heavily influenced by Chinese Buddhism and Korean Buddhism. Thanks to invaluable Nihon Shoki, the Chronicles of Japan, we even have a date, year 552, but there are several theories as to when exactly the official introduction happened. We can reliably say it was around that time. The King of Baekje, one of the three kingdoms of Korea, sent a mission to Emperor Kimei, the 29th Emperor of Japan. The mission included an image of the Buddha, Buddhist sutras, and other religious items. By that time, the Buddhism in Baekje had already developed because it was introduced through China in the late 4th century. When Emperor Kimei received the gifts and the image of the Buddha, he asked his advisors if this new foreign god should be worshipped in Japan. As you can probably imagine, the opinions differed, and drastically so. Soga no Imame, the leader of the powerful Soga clan, who was basically the head of government, supported Buddhism while Monotobe no Okoshi, the chief of the Monotobe clan and the political rival of Soga no Imame, was strongly against it. The emperor gave the gifts to the Soga clan and allowed them to worship Buddha to sort of test it out. The tension, however, grew, and it did for generations. Each side gathered support for their cause. For example, Soga side was supported by immigrant clans like Hata clan, who are said to have come to Japan from China, and Monotobe clan was supported by Otomo clan, a highly influential family. The opponents of Buddhism burned the temples and threw Buddha images into canals, or so some records say. Their main point was that the native gods would become angry with people for worshipping a foreign deity, and when an epidemic broke out soon after, it was taken as proof of the native gods indeed being angry. You know, the story of a foreign god arriving, ousting the native gods, people worshipping it, and later facing an epidemic. During the reign of Emperor Bidatsu, Emperor Kinmei's second son, yet another epidemic broke out, triggering one of the earliest and possibly even the first instance of Haibutsu Kishaku, a movement to abolish Buddhism from Japan. Emperor Bidatsu died in that epidemic, and it's known that the disease afflicted him with sores, so it might have been smallpox. The most famous instance of abolishing Buddhism is Shinbutsu Bunri, separation of Shinto and Buddhism during Meiji Restoration. I briefly mentioned it in the last video. This is basically what's happening in Miba village, abolishing of Buddhism. It's interesting why they chose to abolish it now. 
Later in Mibu village, we'll see a great number of Jesus statues on Buddhist gravestones, showing that for a very long time, Shinto and Buddhism were equally practiced. Finally, we have reached one of the most confusing and straight-up bizarre areas in the game, Mibu village. Its original name is Mibumura, and as many people who have studied any amount of Japanese pointed out, the reading Mibu is weird. And it is. Mura means village, so we'll get that out of the way. Mibu should be read as suisei, aquatic life, which is a legit word that you can find in a dictionary. However, here it's Mibu. When we encounter a Japanese word with a weird reading, there might be a few reasons to it, and one of the most frequent ones is that it is a name. Mibu is the name of a clan. It can also be written like this, Mibu. Initially, the word Mibu referred to places with aquatic life and many water sources, and then came to denote families from this region. You might not realize, but you actually know already what their clan sigil looks like. Yep, it's Hidari Mitsudomoya, three comma-like swirls going clockwise. We see the symbol in the Fountainet Palace and also on the wooden case of the Red Mortal Blade. We'll briefly touch on the history of the real Mibu clan, because some details are fascinating in the context of Sekiro. Mibu clan was a family of court officials. They were in charge of various records, not unlike the historical Hirata family. In medieval Japan, all court nobles were allowed to enter imperial palace, regardless of their family rank. In the middle of the Heian period, however, a system was implemented that divided court nobles into Jigeke and Toshuke, so the former were not allowed to enter the imperial palace, and the latter could enter it freely. I think you've guessed by now, Mibu were one of the Jigeke, Jige families, meaning that they were court nobles prohibited from the imperial palace. Despite the fact that in Sekiro Fountainhead Palace has no emperor, I think the parallel is pretty clear. Just to the right of the Mibu village idol, we encounter an interior ministry agent. I think he is a part of a Tokuziro group, only he didn't get lost in the fog. I wonder why the ministry sent them here. Maybe they wanted to investigate the waters of the Ashina lands? Not far from him we find a treasure carp scale that was washed downstream. There is a memorial mob nearby, a charming fella who adds a little twist to the usual line of all memorial mob. There are a memorial mob where the dead are, or even the undead, it doesn't matter. From him we gain our first piece of the Mibu village lore, the villagers are undead. Moreover, there is a chance that this merry memorial mob is undead as well, just retains more consciousness than others. If he catches Dragonrod, his unique line is about how little sake he has and how it's not enough. Also, this memorial mob says the following when afflicted with Dragonrod. Memorial mob, I am sorry. Here he apologizes to the other people of his group, to other representatives of the memorial mob. Why though? In an early video about Dragonrod and the memorial mob, we established that these people are traveling Buddhist monks, performing memorial services for the dead in accordance with the Buddhist religious practices. But Miba village stands against Buddhism, and the head priest is turning the villagers into the undead, breaking the natural order of things. Despite all this, this memorial mob did not leave immediately, but chose to remain and engage in this uncontrollable drinking. That is why he is sorry. He abandoned his purpose and his religious practices, but retained enough consciousness to realize what he's done. When you heal this mob's dragon rod, he says, Thanks to you, my horrible thirst disappeared. I appreciate it. Now I can continue my duty of holding memorial services for the dead. Doesn't matter if you're undead. Memorial services and continuous drinking. Isn't it incredible how, because of the amount of context we amassed over all this research, these few phrases from one of the most utilitarian NPCs in the game unravel into a story of abandoning one's duty and falling into temptation? Mibu villagers are generally minding their own business when not alerted, some of them are digging along the riverbanks, and I think they might be after treasure carp scales. One of them seemed to escape the villagers and float past the ministry agent. Or maybe they're collecting the slugs for the carp bait. Otherwise, they are mostly farmers carrying appropriate tools. Their character models are identical to those of the zombies in the abandoned dungeon, which comes as no surprise, really. Some of them carry lanterns, which are essentially cages with fireflies. Others have several jugs strapped to their backs. There are also women carrying dead or undead children on their backs, which is probably the most unsettling type of villager you can meet. In Japanese, the villagers are called Mibu no Murasu, villagers of Mibu. Just at the village entrance, we can see a rope above with various things and other ropes tied to it, including pieces of white serpent shed skin. There is also a weird wreath with a piece of maybe crystal fixed in the center, 
and I have no clue what this might be and for what. It's depicted in the art book as well. Maybe it's just something to mark the entrance to the village, or maybe it has some other significance. Around the corner we can find a lump of fat wax on the ground. These things form rarely in a human body and are a sign of a disease, which fits very well with the undead villagers. Jesus statues that are peppered here and there throughout the village are all beheaded, just like the ones before the Miss Noble Temple. The art book gives an overview of the village marked as Miba Village Settlement. A very grim sight, honestly. The art book also depicts several house interiors. Interestingly enough, the house where we find Cholsky hiding in his basket is marked specifically as Weaver's house. You can even see the loom inside of the house, just near Cholsky. Red fabric stretched out on wooden boards or hanging from poles is drying blood-stained cloth. Apparently, that's why these slugs are all over it. They must be fond of the blood. Further into the village, we'll see moths eating through the fabric. As to why they would even make the fabric, later we'll see that it is used to dress small wayside shrines that lead to the wedding cave, and it's also draped around as improvised toddy gate and inside the Shinto shrine where the head priest is. The grappling points on the roofs are wrapped in snakeskin, which I think is an indication that serpent might have passed somewhere near Amoeba village. I don't think the villagers have any qualms with the white serpent because it is a Nushi, a god of the land, much like their beloved carp. Maybe they worship the serpent too. Let's visit Shulske. The poor guy is scared out of his mind, but he's still a source of valuable information. When Wolf addresses him, he asks Wolf if he is an honorable person, Matomo na hito. Matomo means honest, proper, sensible, and the like, and I think Shosuke uses this adjective to set Wolf apart from the zombie villagers. He tells us that the villagers going insane is quite a recent occurrence, and he didn't notice how the village fell into ruin, which is quite surprising. He explains that he was able to snap out of it when he threw up. According to Shosuke, the head priest of the village treats the villagers to sake that makes them thirsty. They have no choice but to drink from the rivers and ponds, which makes them even thirstier, and then they lose their mind and start fearing fire. It's difficult to say if the sake itself causes the zombification, or if it is given just to provoke thirst. Then again, I think the sake is made from the same water. Shosuke claims that the priest treats them to sake in order for them to become miyakubito, written in katakana in the original script, but this word also has kanji, residence of the imperial capital, or in this case of the imperial, read fountainhead, palace. However, Shosuke is not really sure what it means. Another interesting bit he tells us is about Inuhiko, the hunter who lives on the outskirts of the village and burns resin to scare the villagers away. Shosuke's voice acting is incredible in this part of the dialogue. The disdain with which he speaks about Inuhiko's fire reveals that he is already too far gone, and it foreshadows his fate. There is a line that might be considered weirdly specific. Inuhiko is the village outcast. He eats wild meat and the like. That is why the head priest doesn't give him any sake. In 675, Emperor Tenmu banned consumption of beef, horse, chicken, and other meats during the farming season, but as time went on, this ban transformed into a year-round taboo against consumption of all meat. This ban was prompted by the Buddhist religion. Since you can be reincarnated into other living beings, you run the risk of consuming your own ancestors if you consume meat, especially mammals. Moreover, Buddhist principles of compassion and respect for all life also shaped this ban. However, Mibu village is not really fond of Buddhism, as we have already seen, so what's with the consumption of meat in Shinto? About the same, even before the introduction of Buddhism, meat wasn't a staple in Japanese diets. In Shinto, meat eating was considered to be unclean, so historically people relied more on seafood. Moreover, animals were often considered to be kami's messengers. Thus, it's no wonder that Inuhiko eating meat doesn't really inspire friendship between him and the head priest of the village. It's honestly a pity that we never get to meet Inuhiko. Maybe he left the village, maybe the villagers got to him, we'll never know, but thanks for the resin. Throughout the village, even before diving into the river, we can see these bodies planted into the ground upside down. If you remember, there is a zillion of them on the bottom of the river. They do not make much sense lore-wise, initially I thought they had something to do with the Mibu breathing technique, but firstly, why would you bury yourself in the mud if you can breathe underwater? Secondly, all those given the technique were supposed to ascend and not drown themselves. And thirdly, these bodies being on land do not make sense at all. So I take it to be a reference to Inugami Keno Ishizoku, the Inugami family, a very influential Japanese film released in 1976, remade in 2006. 
Weirdly, I am pretty satisfied with this conclusion, probably because in the unused parts of the script, Mibo Village is referred to as Innsmouth, so what's one more reference? As we go further, we arrive at the graveyard. The view is called Doso no Sotoba, Burial Sotoba. There are some Buddhist Sotoba here still, other graves are marked just with stones tied up with bamboo, which I'm guessing is Mibu's non-Buddhist way of burial. We can also see ancient Ishidoro, stone lanterns with flickering flames in them. You know it's much nicer to walk around the village without undead villagers trying to grab your ankles all the time. Let's talk about the sakura tree. In the art book it's called Takozakura, literally octopus sakura. There are several legit plant names in Japanese that include the word tako, octopus, and as far as I can tell they were all named so because some of their parts look like some parts of an octopus, so it's purely a visual metaphor. This sakura is flowering out of season like the ones from the Fountainhead Palace, but I think this one is an undead sakura. It feeds on the same water as the villagers drink, so it's sort of a zombie sakura. It's all covered in mushrooms and its belly is all bulged up, which reminds me of the curse rotted great wood from Dark Souls 3. The villagers obviously worship it, they bring gifts, light candles and pray. Undead villagers praying to an undead sakura. After a healthy hike up the rice fields that the zombie villagers still try their best to maintain, we come up to a little Shinto shrine with an offering in front of it, Ashina Sake. As we go up the hill, we come across one more shrine where the offerings are a Mubu balloon of soul and a bunch of slugs. That's what the slugs are called in the art book, offering to the gods. Before the watermill, there are super aggressive blue robed guys that are prospective blue nobles. The animation of them stabbing Wolf with a knife and nobles stabbing him with a flute after robbing him of his youth are identical. Another curious detail, the village is full of persimmon trees, and the villagers even collect persimmons in baskets to dry them. Watermill idol is called Suishagoya, watermill, nothing special here. Let's visit Inuhiko's house, shall we? Around this part of the village we can see several bodies hanged on the trees. If you look closely you'll see that they are holding something in their hands. Looks like a Buddhist effigy, not unlike those we saw in the big bonfire in the hidden forest, and not unlike the homeward Buddha that Wolf has. I think these are the villagers who refused to give up Buddhism and continued practicing it, secretly or otherwise. Their houses nearby had been burned to the ground, just like the temple. On the roof of Inuhiko's house there is adamantite scrap, and weirdly enough the villagers get triggered as soon as you loot it. I previously thought that they spawn after you take the pine resin, because it stops smoldering and keeping them at bay, but turns out you can just loot scrap and trigger them. After you take the resin, you can go back to Shosuke and discover that he gave in to the temptation, drank all the sake and went insane. There is nothing more to see here, so let's go left from the idol. There, for the last time, we meet Jinzaemon. He seems to be badly hurt and dying, but he's not worried much about his condition, he finally found the shamisen player. We discussed him, Lord Sakuza and Orin in one of the previous videos, check it out if you haven't. Orin is my favorite miniboss in the game, her fight is incredibly enjoyable. In the art book she has a whole page dedicated to her. Her original name is Mibu no Orin. The official localization translates it as Orin of the Water, which is weird to me, especially because we have already established that the reading of this word is Mibu. Another option often found in the wikis is Orin of Mibu, meaning Orin of the Mibu village, which is not bad, but I think we can come up with something way cooler than that. Mibu Orin, as in Orin of the Mibu clan. Her name follows the exact same pattern as all the names in medieval Japan, where you have the name of the clan plus no plus given name, like Minamoto no Yoshitsune, which means Yoshitsune of the Minamoto clan. The use of the no particle was decreasing by the start of the 15th century, that is why it's not really used in other secular names, and people have names that we are more used to today, like Ginichiro Ashina. But still, this is the only way her name makes sense to me, because if she was from the village, I feel like the word village would be somewhere in there. She is vulnerable to Sabimaru, this fact betrays her Okami heritage. As for her given name, Urin, the kanji Rin is fairly rare and it has many meanings, but it can be used to characterize a voice or a sound as clear or ringing. I was always confused about Urin's timeline, she appears as an apparition, she looks like a regular human, and because of the decrepit state of the village, I always thought that Urin was super ancient. But if so, how could she be connected to Jinzaemon, who is about Wolf's age? However, some things can help us ground Orin in the flow of time, and mainly it's her shamisen. According to the most popular theory, shamisen came to Japan through China around mid-16th century, which is very recently in relation to the events unfolding in Sekiro. Moreover, the village hasn't been in this sorry state for a long time. 
Shulsky is still in his half-sound mind, Inuhiko is supposed to remain completely human, the memorial mob is not completely gone, the head priest is also still human. Jinzeimon's father, possibly Lord Sakuza Emon, definitely knew something about the village as he advised his son to never go there. Mibu village was fine until fairly recently, and Orin was probably alive not such a long time ago. Orin is quite a confusing character, to be honest, because she has some conflicting characteristics. The basket on her head seems to be a tengai, a type of kasa hat worn by Komoso, traveling monks of Zen Buddhism. She wears kimono, waraji sandals, and teko, hand and forearm covers. And while these things separately do not point specifically at a Komoso monk, apart from the tengai that is a Komoso-only thing, this is how Komoso used to dress. The green thing draping from her shoulders seems to be a type of bag for collecting alms. Komoso often used boxes for that, but fabric bags were not unheard of. She also has prayer beads going around her wrist. The timeline sort of fits, even though Komoso monks flourished during the Edo period, they had been around since 13th century. However, the thing that doesn't really fit the Orin Komoso narrative is her shamisen. Just as Tengai was a sure sign of a Komoso monk, so was their shakuhachi flute. They didn't play shamisen. I'm inclined to think that Orin might be a hybrid character between a Komoso monk and a Goze-san. Goze is a historical term that refers to visually impaired Japanese women who often worked as musicians and traveled the land. If you look under Orin's tengai, which is rude but still, you can see that her eyes are kind of milky whitish, as if she's blind. Unlike other monks we've seen, she carries a legit weapon. If you circle around her as she's playing, you'll be able to see the blade strapped to the other side of the shemisen's neck. Maybe Orin is a traveling Komoso monk from the Mibu village, otherwise she wouldn't be Mibu no Orin. Maybe she started her travels in hopes of finding Lord Sakuza, although she's not supposed to engage in any kind of romantic relationships, whether a Komoso or a Gozei-san, but what's done is done, I guess, but came back home empty-handed just when the abolishing of Buddhism started and she was also murdered for her religious beliefs. She got sort of stuck in this world as an apparition, calling Jin Zaymon with her lullaby. As we cross the bridge, we find ourselves in front of the main shrine. It's locked, and the villagers are gathered in front of it with a blue-robed guy trying to get inside. They probably want more sake from the priest. The shrine is a sorry sight. The first floor is crowded with empty sake jars and a Buddha statue, which I'm pretty sure is Jizo, just like the one in the Hidden Forest Temple, only beheaded and with both hands missing. In the corner we find a rare item, a red lump, a trace of a person who couldn't become the thing they wanted. I wonder who else was here apart from the head priest. Now about him. His dialogue is not incredibly diverse, he just gulps sake and complains about how it doesn't melt completely inside of him. At one point he mentions water of the palace by the exact name of the item, so he knows it exists. I'm not sure why he thinks he can get it here, when the item description says that this water is offered to those who ascended with the wedding procession. He wants to be allowed to join the lowest ranks of servants, Matsuza. In the original, citizens of the palace that he mentions are Miyakobito, exactly as Shiosuke told us before. On the second floor we can see an untouched Shinto shrine with a very interesting item and shrine here, a sakura branch. It's been a long time since we have looked at the corrupted monk, hasn't it? Allow me to remind you the most important lore bits that we discovered back when we talked about bosses and remnants. The original name of this boss is Hakaiso, a monk who committed defense against Buddhist commandments. She is a fully ordained Buddhist nun, her real name is Yao Bikuni, which is most likely a reference to the Ningyo legend. She is possessed by a centipede. The remnant of this version, which is an illusion that can be harmed by snapseeds, mentions that she guards the wedding cave door, however, the reason for it is unknown. She wears a Hanya Yaksha mask, associated with jealousy and obsession, and she drops a Mibu breathing technique, which should, according to its description, belong to the founder of the village who passes this technique in secret to those chosen for the bridal procession so they can meet the dragon. Wow, that's a lot of interesting information. I was always struggling with putting the monk into the whole picture of Mibu and Fountainhead. What is she doing and what does she want? I believe that the Mibu conflict is centered around their lost ability to ascend to the palace. They used to be able to, as proven by the description of the Mibu breathing technique and the nobles up in the Fountainhead, but they can't anymore. As we can see, the head priest blamed Buddhism for that. He either thought that the gods, Carp and Dragon, are refusing them passage because they practice another religion, or it happened because corrupted monk, who is a former Buddhist practitioner, just sealed the door and grabbed the secret technique. From the sheer number of Jesus statues around the village and two temples with Buddhas, we can see that Buddhism had been practiced in Mibu for a very long time, on par with Shinto, 
until something happened and the priest ordered to behead all Jizu images, burn the Buddhist temple and hang those who continued the practice. I wonder what triggered it. Since we have the secret breathing technique now, we can explore the bottom of the river. There are some evil carps inhabiting the waters, a couple of regular treasure carps, and a red-eyed treasure carp for Dojun's quest. An incomplete creature that will never be dressed in brocade. I feel like it's the same type of carp the pot nobles turn into if you give one of the base to the carp, only not really sentient. Apart from carps, the bottom of the river is littered with bodies planted upside down and just mounds upon mounds of horned slugs who feed on them. And I suppose that's the main way of breeding them for carp baits. They feed on blood and flesh. Another interesting place we can now visit is the pond and temple grounds, where we can find Holy Chapter infested, if not received earlier, another statue of Kanon with many arms like the one in the main hall, and also several statues of guardian deities. This idol is called a stone door of the procession. It opens with a really awesome sound when you kill the corrupted monk. The art book depicts stone stelas that are on the both sides of the door. When we talked about the corrupted monk back in Remnants, we discussed all the words and names that pertain to the procession and this wedding ceremony. Throughout the game we find two palanquins, one in the Sunken Valley for marrying the serpent, and another one here for ascending to the fountain at Palace. This one is different, it has Suzu, Shinto bells, attached to it. The ringing of Suzu is supposed to call the kami to attract their attention. It's not the first time we've seen Suzu though. In Ashina Castle there is an image of the dragon before Ashina Dojo and a Suzu just below it. When praying, people ring the bell, believing that with this sound they call the attention of their kami. It's quite tricky to establish any kind of timeline here and which palanquin came first, but at this time I'm inclined to think that the bridal procession is possibly the most ancient form of worship in national lands, reserved previously only for the god of the land, White Serpent Nushi. I still think that when the dragon arrived, the people extrapolated their way of worshipping to him and built another palanquin for marrying the dragon. On the other hand, maybe it was already there for marrying the carp, because I have a feeling that the carp has been around the fountainhead longer than the dragon has, and the Mibu people obviously have a lot of tender love towards the giant fish. I think it is safe to assume that whenever the Moes clan constructed the aroma of the palace and descended, they did it from here. Mibu village must have been a beautiful and lively place in the past. Then something happened, the water went all bad, which it wasn't because Mibu balloons were made aplenty and with various miraculous effects, and the passage to the palace was closed. Well, this concludes our Amoeba village research. I hope you learned something new. I know that after you get the shelter stone, the first Ashina invasion starts, but we'll deal with both invasions after the fountain at palace. So next time, we'll ascend and try to make as much sense as possible of the Okami, nobles, dragon, and everything else. We'll also try to somehow untangle the fountainhead palace versus divine realm conundrum, which has been my headache for the last few years. Oh, and please excuse the lack of coherence that plagues this video. There are so many loose threads to tie up because we're almost done, so I'm jumping all over the place trying my best not to forget anything. Don't forget to check the description for all the links and more reading. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.